So the deal's been done, but the DUP for the moment says no. This is Seamus McKee standing in for William Crawley in a specially extended edition of Talkback. Over the next two hours, we'll have all the analysis and reaction as the fallout begins. Also on today's programme, Ivor Bell, former senior IRA leader, acquitted of any involvement in the abduction, murder and disappearance of Jean McConville. We'll have the latest from Belfast Crown Court. Call us on 03030 80 Tweet at BBC Talkback, text 81771 or email the programme talk.back at bbc.co.uk. So a Brexit deal has been agreed at last between the UK and the EU negotiating teams before a meeting of the European leaders in Brussels today. At 10.45 this morning, Boris Johnson tweeted, We've got a great new deal that takes back control. Now Parliament should get Brexit done on Saturday so we can move on to other priorities. But... The DUP, for the moment, is saying it cannot support the deal. Michel Barnier, the EU's chief Brexit negotiator, gave a press conference within the last hour. Here's some of what he had to say. Discussions over the past days have at times been difficult. But we have delivered. And we have delivered together. The solution that we found rests on four main elements. Number one, Northern Ireland will remain aligned to a limited set of EU rules, notably related to goods. Number two, beyond applicable procedures, there is also the question of customs duties. Northern Ireland will remain in the the UK's customs territory, it will therefore benefit from the UK's future trade policy. But Northern Ireland will also remain an entry point into our single market. Number three, this night and this morning also, uh, we were working on the issue of VAT. And finally, number four, Prime Minister Johnson and the Taoiseach wanted to ensure long-term democratic support for the application by UK authorities of relevant union rules in Northern Ireland. Four years after the entry into force of the protocol, the elected representatives of Northern Ireland will be able to decide by simple majority whether to continue applying relevant union rules in Northern Ireland or not. Let me say very frankly that for me, since day one, since uh, three years, what really matters are the people, the people of Northern Ireland and Ireland. What uh, really matters is peace. Michel Barnier is speaking within the last hour. Let's tease out what has been agreed. I'm joined by our economics and business editor, John Campbell from Brussels, and with me our political team, our editor, Mark Davenport, and our colleague, political correspondent, Enda McClafferty. John, first of all, what has been decided here about our membership of the customs territory of the EU? Seamus, can I just tell you a little bit about where I am at the minute, though? I'm, I'm just outside a hotel on the Place Jordan in Brussels, where I've been speaking to some of the main players this morning in the Brexit drama. I think Angela Merkel is just about to arrive here. I can hear a helicopter clattering overhead, which suggests that she will be here very shortly. I will persevere, though, but I might have to break off when she arrives. And customs. Um, what is going to happen is Northern Ireland will remain within the UK's customs territory. It won't be part of the EU customs union. However... Northern Ireland would effectively act as a sort of agent for the EU in terms of goods which may move through Northern Ireland on in to the the single market. Now I can just see a car arriving here which I I, I think may be Angela Merkel. So Seamus, if I break off um, very quickly here you'll you'll know why that is. Yes, this is Angela Merkel arriving. Just hold on. Um, So yeah, I can... Angela Merkel here is is meeting the members of the the EPP uh, which is the largest group um, in the European Parliament. Um, Chancellor Merkel! Chancellor Merkel! Uh, 
She's no, she's not stopping to talk to us. Um, I will a continue. Good try, John. Uh, <laughs> good try. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, yes. So that's her. That's her helicopter. You can hear clattering overhead. Um, anyway, in terms of the customs territory, it would mean that Northern Ireland leaves the EU's customs union. It would, however, continue to carry out EU customs procedures on goods which are coming in to Northern Ireland. Now, the, the important point that Michel Barnier was making there, one I think which the Prime Minister will seek to emphasise, is that it will allow Northern Ireland to continue to participate in UK trade deals. So, if as a result of Brexit the UK is able to go out into the world and strike new trade deals, Northern Ireland will have access to those from a customs point of view. Um, there were the three other main points really that Michel Barnier were making there was around goods regulation, so Northern Ireland would continue to follow many EU rules in terms of goods, particularly in agriculture and animal health, which would mean checks at Irish sea ports. There, a deal has been worked out on VAT, and then there's this very important issue of consent about how Stormont would choose to follow or not follow the special arrangement for Northern Ireland. John, can we just tease out a bit more about the customs protocol? Does this mean or yeah. will this mean checks at... Ports, Larne, for example. It, it could do, um, because w what will have to happen is that customs declarations would have to be made on goods coming in to Northern Ireland from Great Britain. So you, you could potentially have situations where there would need to be some kind of customs enforcement procedures, maybe occasional random checks. Michel Barnier said that the EU would effectively trust the UK authorities to do that on, on their behalf. There, there's, there's, a, there's a complication here, and this is a, a dual customs arrangement. So, effectively, what would happen is that goods which are coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and are intended to be used or consumed in Northern Ireland, they would not be subject to tariffs because that is internal UK trade. However, goods which you couldn't prove were going to be consumed in Northern Ireland and might go on into the EU, the EU tariffs, the EU procedures would have to happen. Now, if, if subsequently your goods don't actually end up in the single market, they are consumed in Northern Ireland, you would be able to claim a customs rebate. But it, it is certainly going to mean new customs procedures on that GB to Northern Ireland route, although it won't necessarily in all cases mean that tariffs are charged. And, and if in the longer term the UK and the EU do reach a trade deal where there are zero tariffs, then that removes a big part of the complication. I, I, I think, though... You know, it, it, the DUP did concede a couple of weeks ago that there could be some forms of checks on the Irish Sea if we were to continue to follow EU rules on food and agriculture. So in essence, I think what, where the pushing has come on the EU side to the UK is to say, listen, the point of some form of checks has been conceded. John, Richard Ramsey, the economist, is tweeting, this is a good deal for hard Brexiteers, a bad deal for advocates of a soft Brexit and Remainers. Significantly worse for the Northern Ireland economy than May's deal. More bureaucracy, red tape and complexity. Northern Ireland to become a spectator on any UK trade deals? Is that right? Hello, I think hello, you may hello. have gone. Yeah, are you still hearing well, us, John? I'm back. I've just come. I've just come back. Yes, yeah, sorry. Right, good. Uh, did you hear the tweet from Richard Ramsey, the economist that um, oh, I yes, was Ri reading? Richard basically saying Richard saying that this deal would be worse for yeah. Northern Ireland well, economically and than Theresa May's deal. He finished off by saying Northern Ireland to become a spectator on any UK trade deals? Question mark. Can that be right? Yeah, I, I think what he's what he's getting at there is Northern Ireland would be part of the UK customs territory but it would continue to follow many EU product standard rules, particularly in agriculture. So let's, for example, say that the UK does manage to get a trade deal with the United States, and that would involve new agricultural products coming into the UK, the chlorine chicken or the hormone beef, whatever. Because of the, the standard rules rather than the customs rules, those products could not be sold in Northern Ireland. So you imagine the flip side would be the US would say, well, OK, um, we won't give you quite as good a deal as the rest of the UK might have. That, that is one potential complication I see there, but that would all something to be negotiated. I think with, with Theresa May's deal, what you had was that Northern Ireland would have that single market access, which the rest of the UK would not have, and you would have basically this, this uh, seamless customs arrangement across the UK as well. Clearly on customs, this, this treatment for Northern Ireland is that, that bit more expensive. Um, and, and I think it is... It's, it's pretty clear that if, if you have new trade frictions, as we call them, from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, that 
can and does impose costs. There was a piece of work done by um, a Scottish think tank on behalf of the Department of the Economy quite recently, which was just looking at, at the, the old backstop. And it was effectively saying, if you have new trade frictions between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that would cost Northern Ireland ultimately about 1.6% of its G annual ongoing basis. Um, and depending on how complicated those customs and other procedures could be, that, that might be the territory we're in. So I think we've got to understand fully how this is all going to work, that certainly on the piece around us continuing to follow EU rules, that will help us have, have better access for our manufacturers, I think, into the single market than other parts of the UK would have. John, thanks very much for the meantime. Let's hear from our political correspondent, Enda McLaughlin. On consent, and uh, just explain what this deal involves in uh, relation to the role that there will be for Stormont, for the Assembly. Well, essentially, Seamus, what, what we're looking at here, and this is pretty key, what would happen was that the arrangements, the customs arrangements that John has been talking about there, and, and everything else in this package would, if you like, come in automatically to Northern Ireland. So there wouldn't be a case of politicians here having to vote or decide whether we opt into these arrangements. They would essentially come in, and then after a four-year period, Stormont would have a vote on whether or not they would continue with the arrangements. And the key thing is, here, it would not be a cross-community vote, it would be a majority vote. And we know, of course, the dynamic currently at Stormont is that there's a majority of pro-EU parties, so the likelihood is, if that were to play out uh, as predicted, we would see these uh, arrangements continue. Uh, that, of course, is a step too far for the DUP because they were very much playing up the cross-community vote, something they say was enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. So they very much argued that that had to come into play in terms of consent of local politicians. And what that would have done, of course, was provided their party with a unionist veto. So they could have essentially, after four years, decided it's time to give up uh, on not renewing or keeping these uh, arrangements up and going, essentially. So that was something that obviously the EU had a big difficulty with and simply didn't buy in to in the final shakedown. So is this opt out rather than opt in for Northern Ireland? Boris Johnson's original proposal was that the Assembly would, from the very start, have to agree to alignment with EU rules. Now it's a case of that will happen for the first four years, then the Assembly will have a say on whether to opt out. Is that, in effect, what's happened here? Yes, that, that's exactly what has happened, Seamus, and that, if you like, changes the whole emphasis at Stormont uh, as to who is going to be in charge here, and the fact that it's going to be a majority vote, and we know that uh, unionists have lost their majority at Stormont, it's very much going to be in the hands of the DUP's political opponents, and that's simply the, something they simply couldn't live with. Now, it was interesting to note that the, the other mechanism that they talked about is that if there was going to be a cross-community vote, essentially, that would happen every eight years, as opposed to the uh, majority vote, which they're likely to go with, which will come every four years. So you can see how the DUP, first of all, found it hard to stomach the custom arrangements that were coming down the track. But the whole issue of consent probably was going to be their safety net, where they could have said to their supporters, look, we're going to be in charge of this process. And, and if at any stage we want, we can pull the plug and all this will come to an end. So essentially, it was going to be a time limited backstop, which was something of of course, you remember a few months ago, they said they could live with it as long as they had to switch to end it whenever they felt it was appropriate. So the DUP for the moment, and we've asked them to come on the programme, so far no one's been made available. The DUP saying, as things stand, what does that suggest? to you, well, that as things stand they are not going with this. Well, uh, that suggests, obviously and they go on to explain this in the statement that the door is still open for further discussions with the, the government about finding what Arlene Foster described in that statement this morning uh, as a sensible deal. Of course the problem now is we know that this deal is there it's been agreed between UK and EU negotiators, so the chances of the EU rowing back on anything in this deal, just to placate the DUP uh, is pretty remote. It has to be said. So what we're looking at now, Seamus, uh, is a showdown, if you like, in Westminster where this deal in all likelihood is going to be put to the floor of the House and then we're going to have a vote. And Boris Johnson, very interestingly, in a telephone conversation this morning with Jean-Claude Juncker, hinted that he felt that he had the numbers at Westminster to get this uh, over the line. But he's gone ahead, Boris Johnson, without the DUP. 
Exactly. So something has happened, same as I think during the night, because we knew that the DUP were due to go into number 10 late last night. That didn't happen. We were told that there was still contact between the Prime Minister's team and the DUP. But at some stage during that process, Boris Johnson decided that he was going to face down the DUP, that he had gone as far as he could. He knew there was a deal sitting in Brussels, which he needed to rubber stamp. And he decided to do that as opposed to prolong the process any longer with the DUP. So he in a sense, called the DUP's bluff. He got that announcement out that there was something there. And then the DUP, of course, uh, came out pretty quickly this morning, just before 7 o'clock, to say they can't live with it. Now, interestingly, Seamus, if you look at the numbers uh, as they stand at Westminster, because this is going to be the deciding factor, if you like, whatever happens in Brussels, Westminster will decide the fate of this agreement. And there has been some interesting number crunching carried out today. Uh, and the estimates seem to suggest that Boris Johnson might come in about three votes short of what he needs to get this over the line. We know the magic for him is 320 votes. There's currently 200. And 87 Conservative MPs who take the whip. We know, of course, there are those who were removed from the party recently, around 18 of them. They will come into play. Uh, if they side with Boris Johnson with this deal, along with his existing MPs, a couple of independents, uh, then we could be looking at Boris Johnson coming very, very close all right. to doing this. But the key in all of this, Seamus, will be those Labour MPs out there and whether or not Boris Johnson can convince them to come over to his side for this vote. Stay with us because you'll be interested to hear from our guests. Guest Andrew Bridgen, a Conservative MP, member of the European Research Group, and the Labour MP Ronnie Campbell. Uh, Andrew Bridgen, first of all, is it, is it your understanding that that's what happened? That Boris Johnson decided to call the DUP's bluff? Well, I'm not privy to those level of conversations. That's, that's probably well above my pay grade. But not having the DUP on board, and given that we know now that whatever deal the Prime Minister has done with the EU, that's now closed off. It's clear that the negotiations that will continue will be with between the British government and uh, the DUP. Um, and I hope that they can get the DUP on board because without them on board, it makes it much harder for members of the Conservative and Unionist Party uh, on the Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party to support the deal. But I'm going to take a long and very pragmatic look at the detail. We look forward to seeing the detailed legal text um, and I'm well aware of the political landscape that we find ourselves in and the state of our democracy. Without the DUP backing it, would you support this deal? I'm going to take a long and pragmatic look. Uh, I think it's it's much more difficult without the support of the DUP. But not impossible. Not... Once you'd decided, once you'd had that pragmatic look at it, you would consider, would you, that if you thought it was in the best interests of the United Kingdom leaving on October 31st, you would vote for it? Of course, if I think it's in the best interests of uh, the whole country, yes, of course I would. Let's hear from Ronnie Campbell. Stay with us if you can, Andrew Bridge. And Ronnie Campbell, Labour MP, would you vote for it? Yes. On the basis that we're all fed up in this country, and maybe Northern Ireland as well, three years and we are no further forward. Uh, although we've got a deal agreed, uh, albeit that the DUP are hanging back a bit, hopefully you can come to some agreement uh, by the end of the day. Uh, but it, as it stands, I think people just want a deal, really want a deal. I understand the Remainers, I understand the Remainers just want to kill it and you know, staying fully in the European Union. But the likes of me and a few other Labour MPs, I think we're looking for a deal. Right, Labour and the guise of its leader, your leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says it's a worse deal than Theresa May's. Low, no Labour MP should support it. Well, it's 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 dealt with the backstop. Uh, there was a problem with the backstop uh, and uh, on, on the, the May deal. I think he's dealt with that. Uh, I think we've all agreed that the, the backstop, which he's agreed with, is, is all right and we can live with it. Uh, apart from the deal, the deal might be just the same. We haven't seen it yet, as Andrew quite rightly says. We haven't seen it. The most probably is the mere deal with the backstop uh, uh, removed. So I don't dare to say. So you're going to ignore your leader? Yeah, so well, I'll, I'll be voting against it. Yeah, and I'll be told, I'll be whipped uh, to vote against it, but I'll be voting for it. Right, so how many Labour MPs do you think that Boris Johnson will get to vote for it? I don't know, but I, I think there could be half a dozen. 
Right. That might be less, but Bill Bill Arthur does nothing. Could be enough, couldn't it? Well, uh, I don't know the numbers. I don't just mention them there. It could could push it over the line if the DUP stay away and don't vote. I suppose if they come and vote against it, that might be different. Of course. Do you think this is a good day, Ronnie Campbell? It's never a good day when you when you're arguing about Europe. <laughs> As I said, the only remarks were is I think the British people, the Northern Ireland people, are just fed up of, uh, of all the, the wrangling and the three years of nothing. Uh, and, and I think they just want the. Andrew Bridgen, do you think it's a good day? Well, progress is being made. I absolutely agree with what uh, Ronnie said. And my constituents are fed up to the back teeth of the stasis and the paralysis in our parliament. The overwhelming majority of people, we had a, uh, there was a, a huge uh, 26,000 uh, Comres poll out yesterday said that 54% of people want uh, the Brexit to be dealt with and us to leave. And I think it was 32 were still for remain. So... The overwhelming sentiment is there that we, we want a, a deal, we want to get out, we want it sorted. However, you know, it, it drops to people like myself, elected members of Parliament, Ronnie and all the rest. <clears throat> we've got to make sure the detail's right. So we've got to scrutinise the, the, uh, the detailed legislation. Well, and my big frustration is, uh, I think Boris has worked wonders to get the withdrawal agreement uh, reopened. The EU said they never would. And that was with the, the Damocles sword of the Ben uh, Act hanging over him, taking no deal off the table. You, your listeners need to know that the deal we could have got uh, would have been far better for the UK if we hadn't had that act of, of deliberate sabotage by those who, in our Parliament, who are seeking to scupper the result of the referendum and keep us in the European Union at any cost. Andrew Bridgen, Ronnie Campbell, thank you both. Uh, my guests uh, for some comment on this are columnist Tom Kelly, and we're also joined by uh, Finn McRedmond, who is uh, an Irish Times journalist based in London, and Felicity Houston, who's with us. Uh, uh, welcome yes. to all of you. Tom Kelly, a good day? Well, uh, I don't think it's a good day because people like me would have preferred to remain uh, within the EU. Actually, the withdrawal agreement was a better agreement. But there is a fatigue element coming in and people want a deal. They don't want a no-deal scenario and therefore it's progress and it has to be welcome. You can see the trajectory of where the Tories are going to go in this in Britain. As I pointed out a couple of weeks ago in a column, it's going to be all about British voters and not about Northern Ireland voters. Felicity Houston, well, I, determined I Brexiter. Yes, I am. Yes, absolutely. I know there, there are quite a lot of us about even in Northern Ireland, contrary to what people think. Um, so, yeah, I think it is a good day. Um, I mean, the last thing I saw printed by the EU was 84 pages long. That was just before I came in here. And I can't suggest for one moment that I've read it all. So to give a full detailed assessment of what's being agreed, I don't know yet. Uh, Northern Ireland, you know, we all know that, you know, we do not deliver to the Northern Ireland, you know, excludes Northern Ireland in this deal, etc., etc., costs extra money to get things sent over here. We're always different, aren't we? And I think we're just going to stay like that, just different. We're staying in a, re a customs relationship with the EU. Yeah. Is that what you wanted? Well, I thought... And, I mean, people say, of course, stupid, lever, naive, etc. I believe that if we voted to leave, the EU would behave like grown-ups and let us go, you know, on a reasonable basis. It turned out not to be the case. I also thought we lived in a democracy where those that lost would accept the vote. I'm afraid they didn't. So this is where we are now. It's not really what I would have wanted. I'd have liked a clearer, cleaner break. But if this is the price we have to pay, I feel it may have to be that. Tom Kelly, on consent... How satisfied are you with what's been agreed insofar as you've been able to get to grips with it? Well, in, in so far as that there should never have been the concept of veto when they really meant consent, and consent was going to have to come in the form of some form of democratic accountability, and that actually means a vote at Stormont. And I think people get carried away that no one in their right mind was going to give the DUP or any party in Northern Ireland a, a veto over the progress of a, something so significant as this deal with Europe uh, and how it impacts on Ireland. So I'm delighted with it, and I think we have to move towards a more mature politics anyway, because Stormont wasn't going to 
certificate reconstituted without reform of the petition of concern anyway. And this has just brought it to a head. It's interesting that the Irish government may be very happy today, Tom Kelly, because it was clear that they would be open. Certainly they weren't going to go along with a Stormont veto as it would be seen from the very start and whether or not we should align ourselves with EU regulatory and customs rules. But they indicated they would be open to an opt-out mechanism needing the consent of unionists and nationalists. It looks as if they've got their way, the Irish government. Well, I think it was always, it was natural that they were going to get their way as such. And, and I don't regard it as their way. It's the sensible way ahead that you have parallel consent in Northern Ireland, that you actually are able to move forward in a majority vote situation. This Because this is ultimately about economics. You know, we can talk about the politics of it and how people have taken positions. But even for Felicity there, you know, being in the EU or leaving the EU has been about economics and whether or not your view of the prosperity of Northern Ireland will be better in or out. Uh, and we have different views on that. But ultimately, our, our attitude has been what makes good for the Northern Ireland economy. Stay with us, and Tom, and I'll come to Finn McGredman too, but I want to go back to you, Felicity Houston, and just mm -hmm. on that tweet from Richard Ramsey, respected economist here, yes. where he's saying it's a good deal for hard Brexiteers, a bad deal for advocates of a soft Brexit and Remainers, significantly worse mm -hmm. for the Northern Ireland economy than Theresa May's deal. More bureaucracy, red tape and complexity. Yes, I know. I will obviously, Richard reads the 84 pages much quicker than the rest of us, because I really don't know why he thinks that, and I know you, you, you talked to one of the, uh, um, earlier, some one of your other colleagues about that, uh, John. Um, I really don't know why he thinks it's worse. You know, I, I, I would have to sit with the two things. We are going to have bureaucracy. We have bureaucracy anyway. Anybody who uh, trades across the border, particularly the VAT registered, has bureaucracy anyway. There is all sorts of stuff going on. We all know when we arrive in at ports and so on, there are, there are men in jackets and hats checking things you know so maybe there's a bit more i genuinely couldn't tell you why he thinks that that it's all right a problem. well tom kelly do you think it's worse uh, I, I think ultimately that it is progress as far as it goes in terms of what we were looking to achieve we want the to economy have regular for the economy. And that's what I think people need to keep sight of. Of course, this idea of having to review it every four years isn't a brilliant idea because ultimately, you know, we argue over uh, toothpicks in Northern Ireland, so we'll be arguing over Brexit for eternity uh, under this arrangement. But hopefully, I, I think that the whole thing will be put to bed. And, re and the reality is, when the DUP in particular see that life does not change, the sky stays the same colour uh, after this is all implemented, you know, their concerns will be allayed as well. Well, we'll see. Tom Kelly, <laughs> for the moment, uh, thank you, but stay with us. Uh, Steve Aiken, uh, would Achieving. be leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, probably going to be leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, is with us. Welcome. Thank uh, you. What do you make of it? Uh, like many people, I'm just trying to uh, absorb 64 pages of the withdrawal agreement and see what's in the new protocol. Uh, and it's notable that you just uh, uh, quoted one of the tweets where from uh, Richard Ramsey, who's a very well-respected economist, and actually somebody who, probably like myself and uh, John Campbell, have been through the intricacies of this up and down and the rest of it, and there are really significant issues with this. As I read it, and particularly, first of all, let's have a look at sort of the issue around the consent piece. How is that going to be managed? And how, bearing in mind there isn't a mechanism within the Assembly at the moment, actually there isn't even an Assembly at the moment, how will we get into positions where we could have series of votes? Because at the moment within the Assembly, there has to be qualified majority voting with 60% of one designation and 40% of the other. I don't understand the detail of how that's going to be. And Mark Devonport, who this morning I think was looking quite closely at what that's going to mean. He talked about it would be the most fundamental rewrite of the Belfast Agreement since St Andrews. And we know St Andrews has been a particularly disastrous for Northern Ireland going forward. So what's that going to be look like? Are we going to have a new treaty? Because at the moment there's a three-stranded approach. Are we going to have a four-stranded approach? There, there are so many questions involved in this process and I think we're just beginning to understand the, the levels and difficulties and the complexities that there are. You're a Remainer. You'd rather stay in the EU. You've said that. You said that earlier this morning on the radio. There was no way you were going to back this. Um, the Austrian Unionist Party's position and the p position I supported was we wanted to have a deal that meant there would be no more borders north, south or east or west we wanted to see the framework of the Belfast Agreement being used to make the process work. We wanted to see, yes, it would have been a fairly soft Brexit. 
it wouldn't have been a hard Brexit, but it would have been something that we would have been able to work with and go forward with. What's on the table at the moment? This is not good for Northern Ireland. It is not good for the Union. And we would probably, in all circumstances, be better off remaining. So to the extent that you don't believe it's good for the Union, and maybe the exact reverse, you're with the DUP on this. <laughs> DUP put the border down the RSC. And I cannot understand how Arlene Foster, two borders Foster, decided that it was a good idea to put a regulatory border down the RIC. And I said at the time, and look, Seamus, I've been all over the media for the last couple of weeks saying this time and time again, once you put it there, we're not going back from that. All and right. in every direction we were going to head to, it was going to make the situation worse. Just to repeat, and, we've got it. and I hope to be able to come back to you, uh, Steve Aiken, and we're joined to you by Stephen Farry. But just to repeat, we asked the DUP to come on the programme. So far, no one's been available. Just before I go, uh, and nor are Sinn Féin, just before I go to Finn McRedmond in, in London for a perspective on this, uh, Finn with the Irish Times, let me hear uh, uh, also uh, from uh, you, Stephen Farry, what's your immediate reaction to this? Because I want quickly to go to London. Well, um, a certain degree of, of concern. I mean, I come from this very clearly from a Romanian perspective. I don't think there's any such thing as a good or sensible um, Brexit. But if we are going to have a Brexit, it has to uh, respect the, the very particular circumstances here in Northern Ireland. And I'm not seeing this in terms of threats to the Union or anything like that. But what I do say is a situation that is not as good as was offered in terms of the original backstop. It is going to be more bureaucratic. And one of the reasons we were told about um, Brexit was getting rid of all this European mm. bureaucracy, so-called, and it sounds like we're, we're going to make it, it, it even worse. And the consent mechanism is going to be a source of ongoing mm. instability in terms of, of the, the Assembly. So we could have had a much cleaner uh, set of special arrangements than we have ended up. And I think the economic impact of this is going to be much more challenging for, for Northern Ireland. Whatever we do, I'm right. it's going to cause a degree of, of friction for us. Finn McGredmond, and thank you for being patient with us, uh, Finn. So, Hi there. Boris Johnson, it appears, has decided to go ahead without the DUP. Has he the numbers? So... There is a sense that Boris Johnson probably wouldn't risk putting it to Parliament on Saturday uh, if he was unsure of the numbers. The uh, calculation that has been made for the past three times that Theresa May's deal went through Parliament was that the ERG will not come on side in the numbers required if the DUP uh, don't back the deal. But it seems like the project today is for the ERG to try and convince the DUP on side and in lieu of that, try and justify their decision to move away from the DUP and uh, back Boris. Because as it appears, the ERG prefer Boris Johnson to Theresa May, so they're more likely to back his deal. They also probably prefer Boris Johnson to the DUP. But... Have we been too hasty? Have I been too hasty in suggesting that he's moving ahead without the DUP? Is he still going to try very hard to persuade them between now and Saturday, Finn? Yeah, I think that's that, that's the project of today and tomorrow. Um, whether he will succeed is, un, is, is unclear. The DUP are unpredictable, but Arlene Foster has uh, reiterated her opposition to the deal. So, do you believe that there's any way in which you could persuade them? Uh, without without changing the terms of the consent mechanism, um, I'm I'm not sure. Or, or uh, you know, the, the deal the deal is done now. Uh, what what I, I'm I'm it's unclear what what uh, Boris Johnson could offer at this stage other than um, pro other than cash. <laughs> Right. Uh, and as regards Labour, we had Ronnie Campbell, a Labour MP, on just a few minutes ago, and he was saying he was going to vote for the deal. Jeremy Corbyn has said no Labour MP should vote for it. Has he got a, a rebellion on his hands? What's he going to do? Yeah, well, there's always likely to be Labour rebels. We're talking Labour MPs who come from Leave voting constituencies who are worried about their seats. Um, so it depends. The the deal will probably uh, live or die depending on how many Labour rebels he gets on side. Um, there is also the possibility that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who has now come out in favour of a second referendum, that they could attach a second referendum amendment onto the deal, and the deal could then pass that way, which would uh, leave Boris Johnson in a very difficult situation. It's not 
the most likely outcome, but stranger things have happened. Finn, stay, stay with us if you can. I want to go back uh, to Stephen Farry just very briefly. We're hearing, by the way, uh, a report that senior DUP lawmakers, this is what a BBC reporter is saying, are meeting in Parliament, not budging on consent and won't vote for the deal. What would you say to them, Stephen Farry? Well, I mean, I think the DUP, DUP have been out of step with public opinion in Northern Ireland on this uh, for many years. Not, not according to the votes they get. Well, uh, well, they're still a minority, and I mean, Northern Ireland. But the biggest voted, unionist party. The, the biggest unionist party, but overall, Northern Ireland voted to remain, and the business community have been very clear in terms of what they have been asking for and and expecting. But I think all this narrative about this uh, hanging on the DUP, I think, is misplaced. This is all because of the way that Boris Johnson set set up the arithmetic. And, and, in Parliament, if he was prepared to uh, go for the, the, the second referendum and say to Parliament, vote for the deal, but we will put it to the public with us three choices, full remain, voting for Boris Johnson's deal or no deal, and have a multi-preference referendum, I think it would get through Parliament and this DEP issue would be taken off the table. So if we go for a proper consideration of all the options back to the people, that's the way we get round this, this particular uh, hang-up around the DEP. Steve Aiken? Uh, I can't imagine a referendum with three questions on it is going to work. I think that's going to be, uh, that is just going to create as much problems as it is now. The answer has to be, we need to make sure if we're going to have a deal, it's a deal that works what's best for Northern Ireland. And that comes back to it time and time again, is making sure there's no borders and a smooth yeah. movement with Crumb. So if it's not this deal, Steve Aiken, and then you said for you it's not, what's your alternative? We have been making an alternative suggestion out there time and time again, which is we want to have a deal that has no borders in it and we need to be absolutely in a position where we're actually using the Belfast Good Friday Agreement to help the solution going forward. In fact, what we're doing under Boris Johnson's deal is we're taking the elements of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement to undermine the very principles that it's supposed but to be it's supporting. Done now. The deal's done. It's not done. There's, Seamus, the deal, no deal is done until it passes through Parliament. There seems to be this misconception that just because a Prime Minister or a another person signs a deal in the United Kingdom, he then has to take it back to Parliament. It has to be passed by Parliament where it goes through. But it can't be renegotiated, because the EU doesn't negotiate with Parliament, it negotiates with the government. No deal by the United Kingdom is ever agreed until it's actually agreed by Parliament. No, but let's get, let's get, let's get back to the point. Is this a good deal for Northern Ireland? No, it isn't. Would we be better off staying in? In this circumstances, we would be. And if we can't get a deal, which is a much softer deal, which means that there's no borders north, south or east or west, we've got to be in a position where that for the benefit of Northern Ireland and for all of us, we need to stay in. And this is about the union, because the one thing I haven't seen so far is some of the debate that's coming out of Scotland. What's likely to happen with the going on with the SNP? They're now pushing it, their own agenda for looking for a referendum. And there is all sorts of issues running this. Boris Johnson has opened the genie out of the bottle on this. And one way to get back to grave stability where all companies want and also to reinforce and secure the union is, if necessary, let's get back to Remain because that needs to be the answer where we're going forward. All right, uh, let's hear from Bernard Durkin, who's a Fine Gael TD who sits on the EU uh, Affairs Committee in the Dáil. Bernard Durkin, welcome. Good afternoon. What's your assessment of what we're hearing? Well, it, 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 it's hopeful. A lot is still is, is hanging in the balance. It, this is an 800-page document. It requires great study on the part of, of all sides involved. And the purpose of the exercise has uh, and will remain, from a, a southern point of view, to, to arrive at a situation whereby the least intervention is made to disrupt the economies of both the, of the island of Ireland and the island of Ireland, north and south because we have become dependent on each other. And there will be a huge hit uh, on, on, on the, both economies arising from Brexit in any event. So what the deal is attempting to do is to try to minimise that, to remove borders, to remove all kinds of obstructions, and to reduce, and this must be still remain the case, to reduce insofar as is possible, increased administration, which will impact and can impact badly on the business sectors of both both parts of the island. But of the backstop's the gone, EU. Bernard Durkin. This backstop that we heard so well, much backstop, about that was the red line yeah. for the Irish government, it's gone. Well, the backstop uh, it can only go when something uh, better and more operable is in place. Well, this is it, the today. Question, the question is, the question is, well, that's still... To that's me, what the EU I, and the UK government say. 
Well, it will be decided, where, you know, it's going to be decided as to how it's going to operate and how it's going to impact on the economies of both parts of the island of Ireland. And it's in everybody's interest, everybody's interest, the bi- in the interest of the business sector in particular, to ensure that it remains that way. So the backstop can only be replaced and will only be replaced by a better system, a more effective system, a more efficient. But the Irish government has conceded on its has conceded on its red line, Bernard. Well, no, the Irish government haven't conceded on the red line. The, the, the Irish government have, have remains remains uh, uh, stalwart to the cause at all times. That cause is, as I have said, already said, that we disrupt uh, in no way the economy of the island of Ireland, other than that which will impact on us in any event from. Brexit in, 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 in the context of our deals with the European Union and, and the, the UK's deal with the European so the, Union. So some are, describe, must, some are describing this, you see, as a time-limited Northern Ireland backstop. Is that how you would see it? Well, the, there's a certain amount of, 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 of reliance on that part of it. But in any event, when, when, when it comes to be signed up and agreed to by all involved, and it must be by all involved, it must be uh, as good as the Good Friday Agreement. And because the good, the backstop is there to protect the Good Friday Agreement. And whether we like it or not, we can all adopt all the positions we want to. And by the way, I would emphasise this. It is not in the interest of, of Southern Ireland to impact negatively on the economy of Northern Ireland. Because it would be, it, it, that would be a contradiction. We, we want both parts of the island to work in unison for the benefit of the respective communities with the least intervention from bureaucracy uh, or, 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 or customs or whatever. So we, we remain within the customs union and we remain within the single market. And whatever is required after that to comply with the conditions set out in, 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 in the Good Friday Agreement and the backstop is there for that purpose. All right, so, Bernard. As was already said, as was already said from the very outset, and, and all our uh, teachers and the ministers have said this from the beginning, is the backstop uh, can be replaced by something that is better. Uh, and serves the purposes of the backstop and the Good Friday Agreement. All right, Bernard Durkin, thank you very much for joining us. Let's go back to uh, Enda McTafferty, our p- political uh, correspondent. Uh, at least I'm hoping to go to you, Enda. Yes, yes. Uh, you're there. Good. Yes. Uh, let me take that up with you. Has the backstop gone? Well, that's a good question, Seamus, because it definitely is unrecognisable to what was there whenever Theresa May put her last withdrawal deal on the table, because you will remember that was applying to all of the UK and not just Northern Ireland, so it is a very different feel this time around. So you could say effectively what was on the table for Theresa May is now gone, and we're looking at something very, very different. And what's been interesting, Seamus, watching the debate over the past hour or so, has been all the ERG Brexiteers now starting to position and manoeuvre themselves to sort of give hints as to how they might go with this come a vote on Saturday because we know if Boris Johnson does not have the DUP in his corner the two key elements will be how many of the Brexiteers he can count on and how many Labour MPs he can count on to essentially cross the House and and vote with him and just listening to Ian Duncan Smith within the past few minutes he is very concerned about the whole area of consent and he is drawing attention to the fact that this very much goes against the Good Friday Agreement because it is rewriting the rules if you like of how Stormont operates and that's why he is flagging up that he is not totally bought into siding with Boris Johnson's deal right now but he does he does say that he's given a consideration uh, and and he hasn't arrived at a position yet until he sees all the detail but nonetheless it's interesting to watch all that play out Seamus because we know how the ERG is going to play this because they've already told us they have a procedure in place where their officers will make a recommendation to one of, at a group meeting and then it will be down to individual ERG members uh, to decide how they are going to vote so essentially will they align themselves with Boris Johnson or will they align themselves with the, uh, the DUP and there's just one extra thing to consider Seamus in all of this remember what happens on Saturday night <coughs> at 12 o'clock the Ban Act kicks in. So you will have MPs voting possibly on this on Saturday with the knowledge that if this does not go through, then what's coming down the track most likely is an extension. Thanks. And uh, let's go to a couple of callers. That's what uh, you are, the callers. That is what this programme is all about. Brendan, good afternoon. What would you like to say? Good afternoon, Seamus. Seamus, my point would be that the Boris has done this deal. Uh, he's basically went ahead and done the deal without the DUP's consent because he doesn't need it. He has no intention of this getting through the House of Commons, uh, and he knows it won't go through. 
this is really all smoke and mirrors to get a general election because he can turn around and say to the people afterwards, listen, the Commons rejected my deal. Uh, there's nothing I can do. I want to take it to the people. He's already gathering votes. So you think he's going to put this to Parliament in the knowledge that it will be defeated? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. That's what he's at. Boris is a very smart man. He knows what he's doing. But then he has to ask um, for an extension. Well, from what they're saying on, on television there this morning, uh, he's asking Michelle Barnier to guarantee that they won't, they won't give them an extension. Well, it, there's been no such guarantee forthcoming from the European Union. So he's no obliged to ask for an extension. Uh, he could, of course, ask for an extension in order to provide space for an election. Yeah, exactly. Um, and apparently, you know, if you read between the lines, that's what he's at. He doesn't care whether the deal goes through or not. If he gets his extension, he gets his, his election as well. What um, do you think about the deal? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know enough about what has been going on today to, to give a, a, an opinion on it. But... I mean, do you want out? Do you just want it out of the European Union, or did you want to stay, Brendan? I voted to, to leave, but I would like to leave with a deal. Right. Um, and is this the deal that you could leave with? You don't know, you uh, say? I don't know yet, Seamus, so I need to know more about the deal. But, uh, I mean, it's all very complicated at the moment because there's so many different things been talked about. Um, but basically, we need to know what it's going to do for the farming community, for industry, for things like that, which. We're not hearing about, we're hearing about all the technicalities about how it's going to affect the union's population and, and all Iron Forum and all this, you know. So really, um, we're not getting into the nitty-gritty parts of it. How, uh, Brendan, thank you very much indeed uh, for your call. And uh, just let me remind you that we did want to hear from the DUP and indeed Sinn Féin on the programme. So far, we haven't been able uh, to have anyone uh, to interview uh, from either party. We have another caller, I believe. Harold's on the line. Harold, welcome. What would you like to Hello, say? Hello, Seamus. How are you doing? I'm very well. Uh, good. Uh, well, we knew all along that England would jettison the unionist people. That was a foregone conclusion. It threw us to the wolves. How do you decide that from this deal, Harold? Well, I don't know anything about it, uh, Seamus, but that's what it looks like. He's went ahead and the DUP has said what they wanted and he has sort of disregarded it altogether. Do you think, you know, uh, yeah, do you, not, do you not wonder, Harold, if there are some in unionism and uh, maybe many in nationalism who are quite happy that they will have a foot, and I'm thinking particularly of unionists in this, maybe unionists with a small U, they'll now have a foot in both camps. Take the customs deal, for example. We'll remain part of the UK customs union, but we'll be following EU customs regulations. People happy with that? Don't you think some, even some unionists would be happy with that? No, I, I'm a unionist and I would not be happy with it. You can't be one foot in the camp and one foot out of it. That can't be done. Harold, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mark Devonport, our political editor, is here. Uh, well, he appears to have gone ahead without the DUP. They're in conference at the moment and BBC reporting that they're adamant still that they won't go along with this deal. What's going to happen, Mark? Uh, I will be <laughs> extraordinarily surprised if they change their mind between now and Saturday because this is a sort of matter for principle or, or principle for the DUP. Now people will say, well, they, they changed their principles but they obviously changed their principles in terms of a regulatory border down the Irish Sea because they felt that they would have the hand on the tiller via a, a cross-community vote at Stormont and that they could therefore stop anything that they didn't like and it's there's nothing Boris Johnson can say or do to persuade them I don't think this is really about you know whether it's one billion one and a half billion or two billion it's more really to do with the principle because of course they, they will be facing an election fairly soon and um, they're fairly skilled I would have thought in their sort of biblical quotations they'd know the old quotation about um, selling your birthright for a mess of pottage um, I don't think they'd particularly want to be going into an election on the basis of oh we, we've agreed a big new divergence within the UK but it's all right we've got a few extra quid for it um, so I suspect that they will probably sit there um, they have been given uh, if you like a consent procedure but it's a consent which is based on majority voting um, so far as Northern Ireland's concerned so it doesn't really do it for them 
Stay with us. Donita Hupner is a Polish MEP and a member of the EU Brexit Steering Group. Uh, Donita Hupner, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the programme. Uh, now, what does today mean for you as a Polish MEP? Well, you, you know, I, I am a Polish MEP, but I'm also a person that has been from the day one against the, the Brexit. I couldn't understand how one can uh, decide to, to just leave a, a preferential economic area. But the people decided, and then our duty was just to make it really in an orderly way. And so from that point of view, today means that there is a chance that this exit which otherwise would be on the no-deal basis, will have a legal basis. And this withdrawal agreement uh, that we uh, will have uh, most likely uh, after the approval by both sides, that this withdrawal agreement is actually giving legal certainty to, to all of us who will be affected, especially to the citizens, um, to businesses in, in Northern Ireland, in UK in general, and, and also those who are in the on the continent and or in the Republic of Ireland who will be who will continue to have close relationship with the with the UK and Northern Ireland so i think this is important because but the real thing that we have to start think now is just the future because this agreement is only on how we are leaving we are departing how you are leaving you are you are you are decoupling the uh, the two system which after the transition period will be two separate uh, set well, this is only the beginning. But that's so that's the beginning. That's now we are in an organized way. We will you will be leaving UK will be leaving, which will reduce the damage that uh, would be produced by a no deal agreement. But the real challenge and that's what I think that also people in UK should now focus is what will be the future relationship with EU because that's where the losses can be or where the benefits can be from close relationship. You are going to be close to each other. You you will continue to be UK a huge market, UK EU as well. So we, we have to maintain close relationship and let's focus on this. Well, that, that's after. that's what many will say, you see, uh, Hubner, that the EU has won. If we're to talk about winners and losers, the EU has got its way. It's Boris Johnson who's conceded I, most. No, I think we are all losers because I think Brexit is something that uh, uh, that is uh, really an, a process which is reducing our growth potential and we will have to catch up and build new relationship. I don't think anybody is leaving. These were not just like trade negotiations that somebody wanted to sell uh, dearly and other wanted to buy cheaply. It's not about this. It's about really establishing the least damaging uh, relationship uh, between those who leave and those who stay within the system that we created together during uh, more than 45 years UK was in uh, the European Union. You, you'll, you'll welcome uh, what Michel Barnier said about this deal. To move away from our preoccupation with Northern Ireland for a moment, legal certainty for EU citizens in the UK and British citizens in the EU. Their rights guaranteed. Yeah, that, that's absolutely fundamental because that people make life choices. And, you know, we had we have this freedom of movement. You can uh, reside in another country. You can work there. You can study there. You can have family. You can bring your family that is coming, your wife, new wife, or your kids can stay. We are we were going to, to lose all that if we didn't have the withdrawal agreement where this uh, citizenship issue has been an important part of the negotiation, very difficult, uh, but the most important, I would say, just maybe in, in, in the same way important as the Northern Irish uh, issue. Uh, and this having a deal means that we are on the safe side, both the Brits here and uh, 27 member state citizens in the in the UK. And, and you know how important people to people relations is and that we can continue to make those choices. Just, and, and just to very briefly, we, we're just short of time at the moment. Uh, do yeah. you think there's enough time for this to go through and be ratified by all member states before the 31st of October, briefly? This does not have to be ratified individually by member states. This is a European Union agreement, so it's only European Parliament that has to ratify. And the member states within the European Council, so not individually, but as a European Council, they will have to, hmm. to not to say yes to this deal that I hope they will do it uh, tonight. And then the real challenge is the European Parliament, because we have to vote and we don't have much time. It's really 
as, as Brexit, the whole process was really fighting with the clock the whole time, and now it's especially difficult. But we are worrying also about the UK because we don't know what can happen on Saturday. So, yes, there are still challenges ahead of us, but we must not forget that this is really now about legal certainty, and then we have to negotiate in good mood. If we have a deal to leave, we can negotiate the future in a better environment. All right. Well, it, it, it was very good to hear your thoughts this lunchtime. Uh, Danita Huber, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mark, you have a DUP statement, and I know you've just literally handed... handed yeah, you. it's a long one, but I mean, in essence, they're doubling down on their opposition to this deal. Uh, they say uh, that um, uh, the proposals are not, in our view, beneficial to the economic well-being in Northern Ireland. They undermine the integrity of the union. Uh, they they say that uh, notwithstanding Northern Ireland remaining part of the UK customs territory, all goods will be subject to a customs check regime regardless of their final destination. Basically, um, for all these reasons, it's our view that these arrangements would not be in Northern Ireland's long-term interest. Saturday's vote in Parliament on the proposals will only be the start of a long process to get any withdrawal agreement built through the House of Commons. Thanks, Mark. For the meantime, uh, stay with us. We have another hour of analysis of today's deal on a specially extended talkback. Here's the news. On 92 to 95 FM and 1341 medium wave, this is BBC Radio Ulster. It's one o'clock at the BBC News Desk. I'm Siobhan McGarry. Boris Johnson has announced that he's agreed what he calls a great new Brexit deal with the EU. The Prime Minister is on his way to Brussels, where he's hoping to sign off the agreement with other EU leaders at their summit this afternoon. However, he's been unable to secure the support of the DUP, which has been seen as, a criti as critical in getting the deal through the Commons. Our economics and business editor, John Campbell, explains what the new deal means for Northern Ireland. Firstly, Northern Ireland would continue to follow many rules of the EU single market, which would mean checks on some goods coming in from elsewhere in the UK. Secondly, there would also be some customs procedures on some goods coming across the Irish Sea. But Northern Ireland will leave the EU's customs union, allowing it to participate in new trade deals signed by the UK. Thirdly, there's a deal on VAT. And finally, there's the issue of consent. Once implemented, these arrangements would have to be re-approved by the Assembly every four years, but just through a simple majority vote. The DUP has insisted its opposition to the deal has not changed. The votes of its 10 MPs will be crucial in determining if the plan passes in the Commons. Here's our political reporter, Jane McCormack. The DUP is sticking to its stance. It says it won't back a deal that includes a consent mechanism for Stormont, which works on a simple majority vote. The Prime Minister is pressing on, and the Northern Ireland Secretary, Julian Smith, says he hopes every MP will vote for the deal on Saturday to bring this chapter of Brexit to a close. So let's get this deal over the line. Let's make sure we move this thing on. I think people throughout the country are fed up with, uh, with this stage of Brexit. Get this over the line. Get it done on Saturday. Get the bill through Parliament. Let's move things on. The Secretary of State also said the government hadn't abandoned anybody. But it seems almost certain the DUP won't vote for this deal, meaning numbers will be extremely tight for the government. The Taunashta Simon Coveney has described the deal as a big step forward, but urged caution as any agreement needed to be ratified by both the EU and UK parliaments. He said there'd be no checks on goods moving across the border. It is a deal that... Uh, that will protect uh, people on this island, it will protect a peace on this island, it will protect trade on this island, uh, it will ensure that there are no checks, whether they be sanitary and phytosanitary, whether they be regulatory checks, whether they be live animals, uh, or indeed whether they be customs checks. The Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn says his MPs will oppose the deal on Saturday. The Prime Minister seems to have made a deal which doesn't give us the complete freedom of movement between Britain and Northern Ireland. And it does nothing to deal with all the concerns that we've raised during Theresa May's premiership and his about a race to the bottom in rights and protections. The Northern Ireland business community has been reacting to the deal. The Northern Ireland Chamber said that businesses now need a chance to analyse precisely what the agreement will mean for business operations. But Ulster Bank's chief economist Richard Ramsey took to Twitter to say that the deal is worse than Theresa May's deal. The only declared candidate for the Ulster Unionist Party leadership says he would prefer Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK remain in the EU 
rather than sign up to Boris Johnson's Brexit deal. Is this a good deal for Northern Ireland? No, it isn't. Would we be better off staying in? In this circumstances, we would be. And if we can't get a deal, which is a much softer deal, which means that there's no borders north, south or east or west, we've got to be in a position where the, for the benefit of Northern Ireland and for all of us, we need to stay in. And that was Steve Aiken from the Ulster Unionist Party speaking earlier on Talk Back. The first prosecution linked to the murder of mother of 10, Jean McConville, has found a senior IRA leader not guilty. The case against the former IRA man, Ivor Bell, was based on alleged confessions made on the so-called Boston tapes, which the judge ruled were unreliable. Extracts played in court included allegations that former Sinn Féin president Jerry Adams was involved in the widow's murder, which he denied in evidence. Kevin McGee reports. 82-year-old Ivor Bell from Ramon Gardens in West Belfast faced two counts of soliciting the widow's murder in 1972. He was deemed unfit to stand trial and was not present in Belfast Crown Court. The case centred on interviews Bell had allegedly given to an oral history project known as the Boston Tapes. But Judge Mr Justice O'Hara said the recordings were unreliable and biased and could not be admitted as evidence. The tapes also alleged that Jerry Adams was officer commanding of the IRA in Belfast and had recommended the widow's disappearance. Mr Adams gave evidence and denied he had any part to play in the abduction, killing or secret burial of Mrs McConville. Eight members of Extinction Rebellion have been arrested after gluing themselves together in front of the Supreme Court in London. The activists were demonstrating against a London-wide ban on their protests, which will be the subject of a High Court challenge this afternoon. Earlier, another eight protesters were arrested after allegedly delaying underground trains at three stations. And that was the news. Now with the sport, here's Park Coyle. Thanks, Siobhan. Gary Ringrose is to partner Rob Henshaw in the centre for the first time in 16 months. As head coach, Joe Smith announced three changes to the Ireland team that beat Samoa for Saturday's World Cup clash with New Zealand. Also back in the side come Peter O'Mahony and Rob Kearney. England coach Eddie Jones has opted to change a winning team by dropping George Ford for the quarterfinal clash against Australia. Owen Farrell will instead play at fly half. The Australia coach Michael Checker has named 19-year-old Jordan Patea, who made his debut in the pool stage win over Uruguay at outside centre. And finally, Australian-born Shannon McCurley has won a silver medal for Ireland in the women's scratch race at the European Track Cycling Championships in the Netherlands. Thanks, Parag. And with the weather, here's Angie Phillips. Not as much sunshine this afternoon as a band of cloud and showery rain spreads in. Some of the showers locally heavy with a slight risk of hail and thunder. Temperatures similar to yesterday at 12 to 14 Celsius, but it'll feel cooler with a gusty wind. That'll ease as the showers move away this evening. Then a mainly dry night with clear spells. Also cool with lows of 2 to 5 degrees, which may lead to the odd misty patch or the odd pocket of ground frost. Call us on 03030 80 55 55. Tweet at BBC Talkback, text 81771 or email the programme talk.back at bbc.co.uk. Uh, you're listening to a specially extended talk back uh, with Seamus McKee. We're on air until two o'clock uh, following the announcement of a deal between the EU and the United Kingdom uh, government. A tweet just in from Nigel Dodds. The Democratic Unionist Party will be unable to support these proposals in Parliament. For all of these reasons, it is our view that these arrangements would not be in Northern Ireland's long-term interest. They put out a much longer statement. We refer to it briefly just before the news. We'll go back to it. But there is uh, other news to report today uh, and it includes uh, the outcome of uh, a court uh, case. A veteran Republican has been cleared of involvement in the murder of Jean McConville in 1972. She was one of the so-called disappeared. You'll know very well kidnapped, shot and buried in the secret grave by the IRA. On trial was a former IRA leader, Ivor Bell, but the case also heard allegations of the involvement of Jerry Adams and our Home Affairs correspondent, Julian O'Neill, is here. So what did the court find, Julian? Ivor Bell, a senior Republican figure from the Troubles, now in his 80s, was cleared of soliciting Jean McConville's murder. A widow, a mother of 10 young children, snatched from her home and murdered on the false suspicion she was an informer. This was a jury trial which had been running for several days, but this morning the court heard 
that the judge in the case directed that the jury return a not guilty verdict based on the evidence the court had heard. The central element of the case was alleged admissions Mr Bell had made in an interview or interviews some time ago with the oral history project known as the Boston Tapes. And where did Jerry Adams come into it? In his recording, Mr Bell claimed that at the time of Mrs McConville's murder in 1972, Jerry Adams was the IRA's commander in Belfast and that he was part of the decision to disappear Jean McConville, something Mr Adams has consistently, constantly denied. Now, Mr Adams took to the stand during this trial and in his evidence he stated, I had no act to play in the killing or disappearance of Jean McConville. He also added the IRA was totally wrong to have shot and secretly buried these folks, meaning the disappeared. Now, crucially, the judge ruled the tapes were inadmissible as evidence. They were tainted because the person doing the interview was asking leading questions and was, quotes, out to get Mr Adams. This is a reference to Anthony McIntyre, who conducted the interview with Mr Bell for the Boston Project. And uh, the uh, question arises, uh, where does it leave the credibility of those Boston tapes? Tarnished with their credibility undermined, at least in terms of ever being used in a courtroom. Claims about Mr Adams's past have been made throughout his adult life, but in recent years, the Boston Tapes Project has bought, brought him into the Gene McConville murder. Three contributors to these tapes, Mr Bell, Dolores Price and Brendan Hughes, all made similar claims about Mr Adams. But they, like Mr McIntyre, were or are critics of Mr Adams and Sinn Féin. So Mr Adams has used this previously to dismiss what they have said. Now the court has handed him a victory in terms of the credibility of the material, even though it wasn't he who was on trial. Mr Adams, of course, had been arrested by the PSNI about Mrs McConville's murder in 2014 when the, first, when the police first obtained these Boston tapes, but he himself has never been charged. Any reaction? Well, this was a first attempt at some form of justice for the McConville family. Mrs McConville's son, Michael, said they were bitterly disappointed the Boston tapes could not be used as evidence and they asked for a public inquiry. We may not have gotten justice, they said, but this cannot finish here. Questions will now inevitably follow on why the case was considered strong enough to bring in the first place. I should say that because of Ivor Bell's illness, this was not a conventional trial, but something known as a trial of facts, where a conviction would not have resulted in him going to prison anyway. The PPS and the PSNI have both stood over bringing this case, Seamus. The PSNI said in a statement, first and foremost, our thoughts are with Jean's family on what will have been a day of mixed emotions. We will take some time to consider this judgment and its implications on similar cases. It was always our firm belief that we had assembled a strong case and that it was in the public interest for the details to be heard. Thanks, Julian. It's uh, 11 minutes past one. Back to uh, Brexit, the deal that's been announced, we can hear from the SDLP leader, Colm Eastwood. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, James. What do you make of it? Uh, well, it's not as good as no Brexit. Uh, it's not as good as um, the backstop, but it's better than no deal. Uh, we're continuing to study it and, and have conversations with uh, people this afternoon. Um, but I would just caution everybody to stay calm and to, to, to understand what the alternative could be. Um, if we end up in a no-deal situation, uh, we will end up in a very bad uh, situation and we could yet end up um, there. So we, uh, we think it's important that people stay calm, uh, consider all of the options and of course we didn't need to be in this place. If we had have uh, argued, for, if people had have argued for no Brexit, this wouldn't be an issue. If people had have supported the backstop, which of course would have had some checks on agricultural goods, but would not have been able to be uh, uh, really characterised as a border in the area C, uh, we wouldn't be in this situation uh, today. And I, I think the DUP need to think very carefully about uh, their responsibility in all of this. I think they Well, have their responsibility, they would argue, is to the union, which they see potentially being damaged. Well, maybe, may, maybe they shouldn't have argued uh, for Brexit then, or maybe they should have em embraced a soft Brexit when they had the opportunity. And when that went by the wayside, maybe they should have 
grabbed the backstop with two hands when they had that opportunity. Uh, we are ending up in a very difficult situation for the DUP and the people they support because they are they have uh, strategically uh, handled this very, very poorly and now we're here. Now we need to all think very, very carefully about where we are. Um, this will be more burdensome on, on business uh, than the backstop. It is less simple uh, than the backstop. So any if this deal does go ahead, there will need to be a mitigation package as well uh, for businesses to recognise all of that. But I say very clearly, if we have an opportunity to campaign for Remain, we will continue to do that. But we will also not have a situation uh, where we're responsible uh, for ending up in a no deal situation. You say the, the one deal, thing that the, the one thing yeah. just seems the one thing that the, this this deal does is it protects us from a hardening of the border on this island. That has to be uh, the bottom line. That's all it is. Uh, we are right at the bottom here. Um, uh, but it does do that, uh, and that is a good thing, and that has been delivered by the European Union. But we have to. We have to try and uh, get more out of this, if possible. Well, the DUP, we've asked to come on the programme. So far, no one's been available. Uh, likewise, Sinn Féin. You say they've mishandled it. They would argue it's not their mishandling of it. They've stuck to their position. Boris Johnson's betrayed them. They would argue. Uh, well, it's, it's well, they could argue if he's going ahead without them. I'm not sure they have uh, stuck to their position. I've heard them talking about the Good Friday Agreement uh, more this week than they even did when they were uh, campaigning against it. Uh, they're, they're in a very funny place, and I don't want to be beating them up today, but I do think they have to think very carefully about their next move because all that they have done since before the referendum uh, has meant that we will uh, we were obviously going to and I said this very clearly at the time we were obviously going to be in a position where the European Union would be forced to protect the peace process the Good Friday Agreement and the free movement of goods and people across this island that was blindingly obvious and when you work all that out there are only a couple of options either we remain if that can't be done or, or the, then you have the situation where Britain and Northern Ireland would remain in the customs union and single market if that couldn't be done there was the backstop then that wasn't able to be done so now we're in this situation all of that has been driven right. by the right wing of the Tory party and the DUP and they need to figure out are they going to make things worse or are they going to grab what they can get now. Stay with us if you can, Colm Eastwood. We can hear from the TUV leader, Jim Allister. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What do you make of it? Well, the union with Great Britain has been betrayed. Uh, our position as an integral part of the United Kingdom has been shredded. And by the very man, Boris Johnson, who less than a year ago said that a regulatory border in the REC and a customs border in the REC would tear apart the fabric of the union. That's exactly what he's given us. And that, that in consequence, is exactly what it does. And indeed, it's worse than that, because the inescapable reality is that whereas GB can move on and move out into the sunlit Uplands of Brexit, Northern Ireland is annexed out of that, is left in a permanent regulatory and customs border, uh, cutting us off from GB, uh, with locked in with the key on the outside and probably the key in effect in the pockets of Sinn Féin. After four so years, the storm Stormont will have a say on whether or not to stay aligned. That's in the deal. What Stormont? You know, Stormont. Uh, <laughs> is a, a fantasy project, which all Sinn Féin would have to do if there was any threat of Stormont overturning our entrapment in the Irish Republic's economic orbit, would be to collapse Stormont. And we know they're more than capable of doing that. So it is a nonsense consent uh, principle. It doesn't exist. Look, it's very clear. Northern Ireland alone is going to be subject to the EU single market, to the EU custom rules. We're going to be entwined in the EU customs code under its tariffs, under its VAT regime, under the aegis of the European Court of Justice, and removed from the economic orbit of the United Kingdom with those borders in the REC, so that we leave in name only, and over time, our Britishness. It devolves to being in name only. Of course, Jim Allister, this has to get through Parliament, and it won't, if uh, many suggest, if the DUP hold out against it. So if they stay uh, with the position they've adopted so far, it's, it's not impossible that this could be voted down. 
and you would be happy is, with that, would you? Uh, I would be absolutely happy with that because the choice is the destruction of the union in which I believe uh, or voting uh, uh, this down. And faced with that choice, it's no choice. It needs to be voted down uh, because otherwise our union with the GB, uh, as we are put in the economic orbit of the Republic uh, of ever closer union, our union with GB is going to slowly bleed to death. And what alternative did you ever put forward? What, what alternative did you ever put forward? Well, that we leave as one nation. We joined as one nation, we should have left with one nation. It was a very simple concept. That's why we had a one nation vote on it. But now we have a two nation outcome where part of the nation is left annexed into the EU with no escape route and the rest of the nation moves on and moves out of the EU. Would it be that better to stay, Jim Alistair, Alistair if, if this is the deal, would it be better to stay? It would be better to leave now with no deal. Uh, I still believe in the ethos and principles uh, and opportunities of Brexit, but we're not getting Brexit. We're getting it in name only. And we're in, being held hostage in the EU. And in the event uh, of no deal, 40,000 jobs, we're told, would go. Yeah, we're told. We're, we're, we were told all these things perpetually by those who never wanted to leave in the first place. And we'll go on being told them. We were told unemployment would spiral if we even voted for Brexit. And yet this week, we had the lowest unemployment figures for many decades in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. So I don't uh, swallow any of that propaganda, but we're, we're at a, a crisis crossroads for Northern Ireland where we're faced with the union being betrayed, us being abandoned to the economic uh, orbit of the Republic with the view that ultimately it'll be a short step from economic unity in the island of Ireland to political So unity. given all and that, have you any regrets? Uh, yeah, and given all that, have you any regrets about voting for breaking, Brexit? Sorry, have you any regrets? Point. Breaking up the United Kingdom has been the ambition of not just Dublin, but Brussels yeah. for many, many So have years. you any regrets about voting for Brexit? I have no regrets for voting for a proper Brexit. I have many regrets that the Prime Minister has betrayed Brexit as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. And I do trust that all that can be done will be done to stop him in his tracks. Jim Allister, thank you very much. Uh, we're waiting, by the way, for a press conference to be jointly given by Boris Johnson and um, Jean-Paul Juncker. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, I beg your pardon. Uh, I should know that by now. <laughs> He's been on often enough. Uh, they're going to give a joint press conference in Brussels very shortly. In the meantime, Felicity Houston's been waiting patiently here, but listening, I hope, with interest to yes. the various contributions. Felicity, convinced Brexiter, and also with us still is our uh, political editor, Mark uh, Devonport. Felicity Houston, Jim Allister, adamant that it would be better to leave without a deal than leave with this one. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's Jim's sort of style, isn't it? You know, well, it's you, Armageddon. Do you agree with him? No, I don't. I mean, I think um, I, I am a pragmatist. I run a business. I've been running my own business for nearly 30 years now. Uh, we deal with changes. We look at pragmatist, a pragmatic way to do things. As an accountant, I work with an awful lot of small businesses who work throughout Europe, abroad, etc., across the border. People want, you know, to just get on with things, please, now. And Contrary to this thing that business needs certainty, most small businesses don't have certainty. They never know what's going to happen. It would be nice if they could just find out what the new system is, they will adapt to it and let's get on with it. And I do think that given the impact that this issue has had on the country as a whole, the whole United Kingdom, please, Lord, could we just get it done and let us start to deal with the other problems? And then maybe in Northern Ireland, we could have a government that could actually deal with the issues that affect people every single day here, which yeah, is because vital. We've, we've been talking, uh, and it sounds rather academic now that I mention it, about the consent formula that's incorporated in mm. this deal and that Stormont would have a say, but there is no Stormont. And Jim Hallister has just suggested, maybe he would, wouldn't he? Stormont's a figment of the imagination now. Mm. It is the thing, you know, I mean, when are they going to come back? When does the four years start to run, you know, from when we finally get an assembly? I have to say one of the, the ideas behind this 
consent notion would be at least we might have normal politics run by majorities of votes as opposed to the head count across our various sectarian groupings. So maybe we could change the whole of the Assembly to run normally. Goodness, we could even have an opposition and people held to account. Wouldn't that don't be marvellous? Don't get overexcited. No. <laughs> well, it, it looks to me like the, the four years would start to run in 2020, which is at the end of the transition period, and it's going to run automatically. Mm-hmm. And what is uh, so important in many stalwart votes is what is the default? The default, it looks to me, is in whichever way you cut this up, is EU alignment. And it's going to be extremely hard for the DUP to get out of that once they sort of worked that out and uh, sort of checked out how things would work. For instance, I think there's a there's an extra UK unilateral declaration that's also been published which talks about an alternative arrangement, potentially, I suppose, to deal with a situation where there's no stormant and you've got the UK government calling together elected representatives for, for a vote. But I think that those will be the elected MLAs, and it's still on a majority basis so far as I can see. So unless there's some kind of amazing economic turn that makes the EU um, alignment with the EU clearly not in Northern Ireland's interest, you'd have to say uh, that given demographics, given the growing sort of nationalist section uh, of the population, given the fact that the centre ground is EU friendly, uh, we're on a road towards continuing EU alignment under this deal. Because under this consent protocol, there would have to be an opt-out by the Stormont Assembly. Yeah, well, it, it effectively looks like it will be endorsed by a, a majority vote, maybe for four years. The only thing that I can see in relation to a cross-community vote is that if you got a cross-community vote, that would actually keep you in EU alignment for an eight-year period, but there's not really a reference to a cross-community vote bringing it down. It's a Northern Ireland time-limited backstop we've got, is it? not sure it's that time limited. I think it's a front Mm. stop as well, because the backstop was meant to be something that might kick in if they couldn't find other alternative arrangements, whereas the clear thing about this is that the idea is that come 2020, that kicks in straight away. So it's a front stop, not a backstop. It's the future. um, And... um, I mean, I, I, you you campaigned for Brexit, didn't you? I did, indeed. Yes, absolutely. Did you yes. imagine that you'd have checks on goods on 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 the boat going between Lan and Cam Ryan and well, the old Stranraer they, they, port being brought back to life in order to check for there lorries? There are things going on like that all the time, anyway. As I say, when we go through the the ports, we see that. You know, when I take the bus, the air bus from Belfast down to catch the uh, the plane from Dublin, frequently we're stopped across the border, and our ID is checked by Irish border or officials or guards, whatever it is, these things are going on anyway. You I, know. Don't, I don't remember, say, in the 2016 referendum, anybody saying, don't worry, because there'll be a special opt-out clause for personal goods. So if you happen to be bringing your son or daughter back from college in Scotland, you won't actually have to pay EU um, uh, customs tariffs on their goods. All right, I've just got a tweet in from Leo Brown. Not me personally, uh, you understand. <laughs> um, but he has tweeted to say, we have a Brexit agreement that allows the UK to leave the EU in an orderly way. We have a unique solution for Northern Ireland that respects unique history and geography. And Leo Varadkar in this tweet goes on to say it's good for Ireland and Northern Ireland. No hard border. All Ireland and east-west economy can continue to thrive. It protects the single market and our place in it. Hooray, says Leo Varadkar. John Tong, Professor John Tong of Liverpool University is with us. Uh, what have you made of all of this so far? You've been listening with interest to our exchange between Felicity Houston and Mark Devonport. Yes, and it was difficult to demure from anything that Felicity or Mark said because, I mean, this is a disaster for the DUP. Uh, No question about that. Uh, Basically, it is the backstop. Uh, In terms of the consent mechanism, it's difficult to demure from what Jim Allister of the TUV said, that that there won't be any consent mechanism at Stormont because Stormont isn't going to come back uh, and the, the conditions within it, these, these either four-year or eight-year checks, well, I mean, there are optimists and there are people who talk about eight-year periods for the Northern Ireland Assembly. I mean, that takes optimism to, to a new level. So basically, everything that Boris Johnson ruled out at the DUP conference last November is back, and it's back with a vengeance. And if anything, it's, there's actually fewer checks in this than, than what were there, what was pre- previously proposed by Theresa May. So the only hope now for the DUP, which is is effectively the DUP now becomes a pro-Remain party because it has to align desperately with all the opposition parties which will vote, who will vote against this. The opposite, there's no opposition party that's going to vote for this deal on the simple grounds of base politics. It would give rap Boris Johnson a very comfortable general election victory should this go through. So all, all the DUP can hope for is A, the opposition parties all lining up that way and secondly, 
sufficient of the ERG, of the 25 people who voted against Theresa May's deal on three occasions, coming on the DUP side, but I'm not sure that many will. So their only hope, John, is that this is voted down? Effectively, yes, because uh, Leo Varadkar has just talked about a UK withdrawal from the EU, but in effect it's a GB withdrawal from the EU, and it's a Northern Ireland alignment to the EU to all intents and purposes. Many people in Northern Ireland will welcome that. You know, Remain voting Northern Ireland will, will probably... Uh, endorse that, but in terms of the DUP's approach, you can understand why the DUP is so opposed because it's it, it's Brexit, but it's not it's not UK exit. John, what happens if, and it's a huge if, nobody has is sure of the numbers. I'm sure not even Boris Johnson. What happens if it goes through Parliament in spite of DUP opposition? What happens to the DUP then? Well, the the only I suppose glimmer of hope for the DUP is that at least they can't be then blamed for a no deal Brexit. They they died in the ditch uh, opposing. It'd be deal. a huge embarrassment uh, for them. It would be an embarrassment. But remember, I mean that they've recovered from. It, it appeared to be embarrassing in 1998 when they were outflanked and you had a referendum in favour of the Good Friday Agreement. But the DUP and now they're in, now they're back, quoting it. Yes, the DUP was back. Well, that's the other irony. The DUP is not just effectively pro Remain. It's pro Good Friday Agreement, talking a lot about parallel consent. A point that Colum, Colum Eastwood made uh, a. Few few moments ago. I mean, the DUP can recover from embarrassments. They covered. They came back very, very strongly from 1998. It's not 1998. These are different circumstances. But I think they can overcome the, the embarrassment. They didn't want to be blamed for a no-deal Brexit. That potentially was more disastrous for the DUP, given the economic forecast that accompanied uh, that, uh, no deal. So they can it. just brush this off, can they? I mean, there, there are no well, qu- no leadership, uh, no questions around the leadership of the party, uh, no challenges to the leadership of the party. I think the questions around the leader of the party will be, will come with the RHI uh, mm-hmm. uh, report r- rather than this. I think, uh, in terms of what the DUP does, well, you've got to remember that thirty percent of DUP voters. Uh, actually voted Remain in 2016 and they've stuck with the party, they're still with the party and a no-deal Brexit being avoided means they probably will stick with the DUP. If you're a DUP voter, where do you go? You're not a natural alliance party supporter and, and we know the problems of the UUP which seems to be have a biannual leadership change. So um, I, th- I think, you know, that in that sense, the DUP's base may hold together but that's not to say it's not a monumental embarrassment for the party given okay. the way that Boris Johnson has in effect, stitch them up here. I just want to break off there uh, with that dramatic phrase from Professor John Tong uh, to say that this is a specially extended edition of Talk Back. Uh, we're on the air until two o'clock. And now that there's been this deal agreed in Brussels, we're still waiting for that joint press conference with Jean-Claude Juncker and Boris Johnson. Uh, that, we're told, will come up uh, very shortly. Felicity Houston, uh, I mean, the more you've heard this analysed in terms of what it means for Northern Ireland, uh, you said, or you've heard John Tong say it effectively means we stay in well, the EU. That's not what you voted No, for. no, it's not, I know. Well, I'm not quite sure how much we're staying. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a principled thing as well. It wasn't just about whether there's a man at the at the port in Stranraer or, or Larne with a, with a hat on trying to check how, what, what you're bringing back home. And so we've always had stuff like that. Um, it was much more about a sovereignty issue. Now, you know, and a national sovereignty issue for many of us, a United Kingdom one. You know, people break it down and have all sorts of mad notions about what leavers wanted to do. But most of us and all the research shows that it was actually about national sovereignty. And you don't see this representing any threat to Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom, do you? I, well, I mean, that I don't think so because I still think when push comes to shove and they, they decide to have another referendum on the border, the reality of what a United Ireland means economically, and for the South as well as us, and, you know, we're going to have to pay for our health service, let's just start with that, um, uh, will make a difference. You know, we will not be arguing about um, backstops and, and rates of VAT, and, well, maybe rates of VAT, but actually not in the, the, the issues that we're talking about at the moment. It will be a very different... And, and hopefully, actually, because of the amount of analysis that has gone on about our structures and our economy, maybe when and if we have a border poll, there will be a better understanding of what a united Ireland will mean than just whether you fly an orange or a green flag which it's what it's been about before john is it academic now to ask why didn't the dup prepare its base prepare its supporters for inevitable compromises that would have to be made that boris johnson has now had to make that the eu would say it's made as well I think they genuinely hoped that they could get away with their position. I think the DUP would have been quite content if 
Brexit had been cancelled full stop. I don't think the DUP was ever really prepared for Brexit. But Nigel Dodd said it would, he would rather it, we, UK remained than, than go with Theresa May's deal. Yes, that, that's, that's right. And that's, that will be the DUP's position today in terms of Boris Johnson's deal. Far better to remain. It's also the UUP's position because they don't want Northern Ireland ever more detached from, from the rest of the Union, which this, uh, these proposals, this, this deal clearly would represent. Well, that's what I'm really getting at. Was there any way in which the DUP could have sold this to their base? Any way in which they could have done that? I, I th <laughs> that's difficult. The, un the, the obvious answer is no. What I struggled to get my head around was when the DUP suddenly, out of the blue, 10 days ago, offered regulatory alignment offered alignment to the EU single market. That came out of a clear blue sky. Admittedly, there were caveats. The DUP wanted a uh, local consent via Stormont. But given the absence of Stormont, the, the DUP must have known that that was a risky proposition to offer. And, in, uh, and inevitably, you saw we saw the response from the other unionist parties that, who laid into the DUP. And clearly they would have been very conscious of that in terms of their consideration of this deal. Yeah, precisely. I mean, the DUP's position had a certain logic for a long time and was logically consistent. Then there was the, the reasonable compromise of, well, we'll have an all-island economy on agriculture and food. That made, that made good sense, and it looked as if the DUP was moving. But then to offer full-blown regulatory alignment, well, it's only one step up from that to have a, a customs union between Great Britain, uh, a customs division between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and that's the road the DUP was, was travelling. And no, they hadn't prepared the base for that, given you know, the, the, the unequivocal language against any regulatory board, against any customs board in the Irish Sea that the DUP had offered from the day that the referendum result um, became known. Of course, they can say, to use your phrase, they've been stitched up. They would have presumed that the very least they would have got in return for agreeing a border in the Irish Sea, a regulatory border, was hard and fast nailed down consent arrangements at Stormont. Yeah, and, and the difficulty now... Which they had first and then Boris Johnson backed away from that. And clearly has in terms of this deal. Well, I mean, I think the DP never fully trusted Boris Johnson, it, it should be said. He might have been fated at the conference last year, but I think they were always quite wary given his, his previous track record of, of spectacular U-turns. But I think the big problem now is that the DUP's next conference <laughs> is on Saturday week. Arlene Foster's got to go in and, and address very sceptical membership, assuming this deal goes through, ex explain the tactics of the party, uh, explain the defeat, alongside a whole series of other defeats, whether it be the introduction of, of, of abortion, same-sex marriage, etc., via, via, via direct rule. You know, you can look back, if you're looking at uh, an Annas Horribilis uh, of a year, it's one for the, for the DUP, I think. And that's a, de a defeat in what sense, John? In terms of this deal, well, it's a defeat in terms of what the DUP held out against in terms of regulatory borders and customs borders, because this, this deal offers both. Yes, you know, Northern Ireland does le formally leave the European Union, uh, along with the rest of Great Britain, but the treatment of Northern Ireland is very, is very different. Now... To, to repeat, you know, many businesses, farmers groups, uh, nationalists, non-aligned, and about 30% of unionists will, will probably welcome uh, this deal today. So, you know, we shouldn't get, get carried away with, with, with the DUP's own particular difficulties uh, with this deal. And I say there's still the hope. I mean, I think the parliamentary arithmetic on Saturday, it's, it's going to be very, very tight potentially for, for Boris Johnson to get this through. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, we can hear from a member of the Brexit party, Belinda De Lucy, who joins us. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Well, what do you make of this? Well, um, you know, I've, I've always felt very much that we entered into the EU as Great Britain and Northern Ireland and we should exit the EU on those terms. I, I had a very a passionate speech in Brussels last week to President Sassoli um, about that very point that we should leave um, you know, as Great Britain and Northern Ireland as a whole. However, it is complex. And as your last speaker has just said, you know, there are plenty of people in Northern Ireland that may well support Boris's deal. Um, from the Brexit Party's point of view, of course, we're disappointed that it, a lot of it seems like a rehash uh, of May's deal, but that there has been progress. And I feel like the Brexit Party has been played a big part in there being process and the change of, of uh, government direction. And they're getting a better deal. However, we do have we do have concerns. Um, same as the ERG, if the DUP aren't on board, we need to listen to them very, very carefully and listen to their concerns. Well, but can't you make your mind up yourselves, your own minds up independently of whether you support this deal or not? You're a, an independent uh, yeah, party. Uh, you've got you've uh, got your uh, own priorities. Uh, so, do you support it? 
Um, at the moment, no, we are, our concerns are too grave, but we haven't had enough time. I mean, it's only been, what, aired like, three hours. Um, we need to have our lawyers on it. We need to go through it. We do need more time before we come to uh, a, a firm judgment on it. I think that's only fair to the 5.5 million people who voted for the Brexit party. We take this seriously. We owe it to them to go through it with a tooth comb. And hopefully by Saturday morning, um, we'll have gone through it and had enough time to really um, give our uh, uh, final judgment on it. But yes, we have grave concerns. I, Nigel said this morning, and I completely agree with him, we would far rather a short extension in a general election, have a clean Brexit, than sign up to an internationally binding bad deal. Well, even if Boris Johnson doesn't get this through Parliament, if he gets it through, well, he's definitely shot your fox. Even if he doesn't get it through, he's in a much stronger position uh, if an election comes to fight off your challenge. Yeah, well, well I, let me interrupt you because I, I do forgive me, but we are going now over to Brussels because Jean Claude Juncker and Boris Johnson are about to give that long awaited press conference. Uh, there's a delay on the line, so you must bear with us. I imagine there might be some translation too. Here we go. It creates uncertainty, it protects the rights of our citizens, and it protects peace and stability on the island of Ireland. There will be no border on the island of Ireland, and the single market will be protected. The deal is not about us. The deal is about people and peace. And I look forward to continue my conversations with uh, Boris, because we'll start the negotiations on the future relations immediately after the deal will have been approved. We'll start our debates on the 1st of November without uh, interruption. Uh, tonight, together with Michel Barnier, I will explain the deal to the heads of state and uh, uh, government. And of course, it is for both our parliaments to have the final say. It's not only Westminster having to approve the deal, the deal being in fact the treaty. It's also up to the European Parliament to do the same. So thank you, Boris, for, I have to say, excellent relations we had throughout the last weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jean-Claude. And can I uh, pay a particular tribute to uh, you, uh, Jean-Claude, and also, of course, to Michel Barnier and all your team, uh, Michel, in the, in the negotiating team uh, in, the, in the commission. And uh, I do think that this deal uh, represents uh, a very good deal, both for the EU and for the UK, and it's a, a reasonable, fair outcome and reflects the uh, large amount of work that's been undertaken uh, by, by both sides. And uh, I agree very much, Jean-Claude, with what you said about protecting uh, the peace process in the island of Ireland and in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And, of course, for us in the UK, it means that uh, we can deliver a real Brexit that achieves our objectives. And it means that the UK leaves whole and entire on October the 31st. And it, uh, first, and it means that uh, Northern Ireland and every other part of the UK can take part, uh, not just in free trade deals, offering our tariffs, exporting our goods uh, around the world, but it also means that uh, we can take together uh, as a single a United Kingdom decisions about our future, about our laws, our borders, our money, and how we want to run uh, the UK. And uh, those decisions will be taken in the UK uh, by uh, elected representatives of the people of the UK. And I hope very much now, speaking of elected representatives, that uh, my fellow MPs in, uh, in Westminster uh, do now uh, come together uh, to get uh, Brexit done, to get this excellent deal over the line and to deliver Brexit without any more delay so that we can focus on the priorities of the British people, uh, improving our health service, investing in 20,000 more police, lifting up uh, the living wage and many, many other things. And uh, Jean-Claude, I just want to conclude by agreeing wholeheartedly uh, with your final point. Now is the moment for us to get Brexit done and then together to work on building our future partnership, which I think can be incredibly positive, both for the UK and for the EU. 
And uh, I just remind you of what I always say, that we are a quintessential European country, solid European friends, neighbours and supporters. And we look forward to working with you in building that partnership in the weeks and months to come. Thank you all very much. I, uh, hey, hey. I have Jean Claude's the boss here. Yeah. I have I have to say that I'm happy about the deal, but I'm sad about Brexit. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think they're going to take questions. Their questions are being shouted at them. Uh, I'm not sure, but if they are answering questions, we'll go back to that. Uh, initial statements then from Jean-Claude Juncker and from the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who described this as an excellent deal, a very good deal for the EU and the UK, reasonable, fair outcome. He talked about it protecting the peace process, delivering a real Brexit, the UK leaving whole and entire, he said. Uh, Northern Ireland can take part in future free trade deals, uh, uh, exporting its goods around the world. And uh, he also talked about, uh, of course, well, didn't mention it, by name, but also hinted very strongly at the pitch that there would be in an election which he's longed for, saying that it would get Brexit done and enable them to move on to those issues around health, education and the economy. And of course, he came back at the end to talking about building a future partnership with the EU. Well, uh, what do we make of that? Let's hear first from Felicity Houston, who was listening to it. Uh, interesting. Very good deal. An excellent deal. The UK leaving whole and entire. Yes, well, I mean, we know one, one of Boris's plus points is that he's an optimist, and I think that's why he's achieved what he has. Nobody could ever have described his predecessor as an optimist, certainly not in the way she presented herself. Um, I think many people would know from listening to me before this that Boris was not my choice for our Prime Minister, and neither was, was Jeremy Hunt, but um, we have got what we have, and you have to admire him and give him great credit for having done something that we have been told repeatedly he could not do. So I think he has every reason to be a little bit, dare I say it, smug today in the face of so much antipathy from all quarters and, and so many doomsayers. So, of course, he's selling it as positive, you know, and, and the proof will be, as John said, of what happens on Saturday. And he has caught quite a lot of them, I think, in a, a nice little Morton's fork of where do they go from now? <laughs> Roger Pollan is with us, who's head of the Federation of Small Businesses here. Roger, good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, Jim, thank you. Well, do you agree it's a very good deal for the uh, UK uh, and Northern Ireland can now take part in free trade deals exporting our goods around the world. Well, it seems to me that what we're seeing is a 64-page complex document that we need to study and really consider what the implications of. It's a bit like looking at an engineer's diagram for for a supercar. You know, it's a complex diagram, but it's got to be translated into an actual uh, vehicle, which we've then got to work out how we can drive. I think with this looking at a, a technical agreement which will have to be turned into legislation which will then have to be turned into policies to implement that and that's when we start to see how it's going to really impact on the face of it i suppose we've got a number of things one is that business the, the worst that had come for business would have been to have no deal so that has been averted by this in theory although it's still got to get through the parliamentary process um and it also does make some provisions that would allow us to continue to trade uh, with the, with the eu or the rest of the eu uh, so Ireland and the rest of the EU without any regulatory or tariff barriers and also to trade with GB without any regulatory or tariff the, barriers. The best of both worlds? Um, I think with all these things, it, the devil's in the detail and it depends what you make of it. The risk of it is that there's a lot of complexity being added so that the challenge will be in those policy developments as to how you can apply the, the necessary complexity with the least burden to business so in terms of differential VAT rates and so on like that, that can be complex, but you can also find ways of doing it that are not um, so onerous. Um, are there good things in it? Well, there is a suggestion in it that the VAT rate will be the lower of, on goods, will be the lower of the rates between the UK and Ireland. So you can see how we can actually charge less VAT uh, if the, the rate south of the border is lower. Uh, or less fat if the rate in GB is lower. So there are ways that you could start to, to make this uh, stack up quite well, but I think we're a long way from seeing it actually translated from 
uh, agreement today in Europe into an actual final uh, legally binding agreement. Well, that's it. And you yourself have said, of course, it has to get through Parliament. Now, the DUP, and again, to repeat, we asked them to come on. They haven't so far, nor have Sinn Féin. The DUP are adamant they won't support this. What's your view of that if it means that this doesn't get through Parliament? Well, I think what, what we've all got to do is try and see the broadest coalition of support come together to, to get this through. And, uh, you know, everybody has, has recognised that a no deal would be uh, a really bad place for business to be in. And, and you see that's, that's, the other, well. that's the alternative. It's now between this deal and no deal. Uh, if, we, if we look at it another way, there was a different deal available early in the year. The whole business community came out uh, to try and urge politicians to get behind that. And it got comprehensively rejected three times. So uh, with that um, in in the background, we've now moved through to a position where this deal is being put forward as being the, the available choice. Um, so it would seem, yes, that's the, the stark reality is it's this deal or no deal. And what if the DUP holds out against it? What would your view of them doing that be of them doing that? Well, I think that, you know, business needs, uh, business understands negotiation and understands the, the niceties of it, especially as it approaches the 11th hour. And uh, when you've had an impasse, everybody needs room to move their positions. And I think we just need to, to, to look for what else could be done that might satisfy um, people who are concerned about this. I'm sure the DUP aren't going to be the only ones who will vote against it in Parliament. But how can we get more people to, to feel a bit more comfortable or, to, to, or confident to move ground a bit so that this uh, can get through? You don't really want it to squeak through by a tiny amount. You actually want to feel that this is a reasonable settlement with which a lot of people from a cross-party basis, can agree. I hope we want to just try and give people a space to get to that point. Roger Pollan, thanks very much. Katie Balls, the Deputy Political Editor of The Spectator, is with us. Just on that point, Katie, and, and welcome. Uh, is, he go is Boris Johnson going to try, even though the DUP insists it will not back this deal, it will vote against it in Parliament, according to that tweet from Nigel Dodds, anyway, earlier. Is he going to make any attempt to bring them round? I think there will be some attempts, but I don't think it is the main focus here. Ultimately, Boris Johnson has chosen to continue this Brexit deal, even though he knew the DUP did not support it at the time of going for this with Brussels. And I think that the big factor in terms of whether the arithmetic works and whether the numbers add up is, are the government successful in getting EU leaders tonight to agree to say it's this deal or no deal effectively or revoke? Or is he going to be able to get you leaders to say they're not going to offer an extension um, regardless of what happens with the vote on the deal? And I think there is a sense in government that if they can, that's how you pass the deal regardless of the DUP. So he needs the EU to say it's this deal or no deal and the ne he needs the EU to say there'll be no extension. So in what context would the EU say that if they were so inclined? But I think tonight the hope is, and I get the sense there has been some background work. Sorry, here. Katie, the line's not very good. Could I suggest that even as I'm talking to you, you maybe try and change positions uh, if you're able to do that where you are? Sometimes that improves a mobile phone line. So, as I was saying, uh, I was asking you in what context is it thought the EU, if they are to offer him those things, would do so? And it's a big if. So, I think tonight you will see. Boris Johnson push for this. No, it's not holding up. I'm sorry okay. about this. We'll try and get back to you, Katie. I'm very sorry, but the line just didn't hold up. People are very, very busy on this day of all days, and they're having to. We're having to uh, bring them on air as and when we can, irrespective of how good or bad their phone line is. But it was interesting. Uh, Professor John Tong of Liverpool University is still with us. What she was saying. What, about what he needs from the EU and what he's hoping for tonight. Yeah, and, and Roger intimated that as well previously. I'm not quite sure that it's a case of this deal versus no deal in one respect. Okay, I, I accept those are the only deals on offer, but what may happen on Saturday is that you get this amendment tabled uh, to the deal that's on offer, wanting a second referendum. Now... Mm -hmm. At that point, does the EU come behind and say, yeah, you can have you can have an extension? So the EU plays it long and says that uh, you can have an extension, so the Ben Act still kicks in on the grounds that Brexit could be cancelled altogether. You just heard Jean-Claude Juncker saying how sorry he was that Brexit was taking 
place full stop. So there's still a chance, I suppose, for those outright Remainers that, that this is not the end of the story. It's not a case of this deal versus no deal. Remain may still be on the table versus a, via a referendum move uh, in the House of Commons this Saturday. I think it's a long shot, but I certainly would not rule it out at all. There may be sufficient on the Conservative side who think, you know, we, 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 could stop Bre- we could still stop Brexit full stop. Or, and that would be a victory for the Remainers who've come in for so much criticism of late uh, you, over their tactics. You could certainly say this is very anti-democratic. You know, the people spoke and there was a clear, albeit narrow, majority in 2016. It's trying to directly overturn a referendum result. But let's face it, the Liberal Dem- Democrats have been abundantly clear. They want to block Brexit full stop. Labour's moving towards that position on an almost daily basis now. Um, and there's a number of Conservatives, people like, or former Conservatives, till they were expelled, people like Dominic Grieve, who will happily row behind a, a, a an explicit Remain position. So, you know, there's a certain area of the DUP aligning itself with those forces on Saturday, but that's where we are. John, thanks. There's a statement in from uh, the president of Sinn Féin, Mary Lou Macdonald. She says, I welcome the fact that an agreement has been reached between the EU and the British government. There's no such thing as a good Brexit, she says. It's been foisted on the north of Ireland against the democratic wishes of the people. As a party, Sinn Féin has worked to defend Irish interests from the worst impacts of Brexit. It was Sinn Féin who first made the case for a designated special status for the north within the EU, and it was Sinn Féin who insisted on the protection of the Good Friday Agreement and no hard border order on the island as bottom lines. We have also insisted, the statement goes on, that no veto can be given to unionism. Ireland's interests must be protected. Any deal can only mitigate the worst effects of Brexit, a least worst option. The deal agreed today is complex and wide-ranging and all aspects need to be considered in their entirety. We'll be meeting with the Tornister Simon Coveney in the coming hours in this regard. Uh, very much a holding statement, John, isn't it? Well, I suppose it's, you know, Sinn Féin can claim some sort of indication that that special status argument, this is, to all intents and purposes, special status for Northern Ireland. It's true, as Boris Johnson made the point a few moments ago, it's true that Northern Ireland, because it's leaving the EU in formal terms, could enjoy these trade deals that the UK as a whole uh, is about to negotiate. The, so Northern Ireland will be part of those, uh, where there was doubt under, under the previous iteration uh, mm-hmm. under Theresa May. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite special status for Northern Ireland, but it's, it's something akin to it, yeah. Felicity, we're coming to the end of this mm. specially extended edition of Talkback. How would you sum up where we are as you see it now? Well, um, John's last um, scenario that um, the Remainers would now shackle us with another referendum with goodness knows how many options on it too filled me with great depression. And I did wonder what happens if on Saturday the deal gets voted through? Will Remain finally please accept they've lost? Or are they like zombies? You know, and I'm doubtless that will be seen as an outrageous term to use for them. But, but, but things that just keep coming you're, you're back. You're fighting the old battles. No, well, I'm hoping say, I'm not. Please, Lord, no. I don't want to fight the old battle. I'd like it to be over, please. Um, I think that I hope on Saturday that that's it. That we At the expense of people who all along wanted the United Kingdom, and in particular Northern Ireland, that was the majority vote here, to stay in the EU. Yes, but the majority of people in the United Kingdom, which we are still part of, voted by a not insignificant majority to leave. And please, could they be remembered about, you know, not just always the minority? And if we're going to argue about the minority, well, what about the minority of us in Northern Ireland who voted to leave? We're never considered at all. We're completely ignored. So minorities are only important if they voted the way you wanted them to. So I'm very optimistic Saturday the PM will get his vote through and then we can go on and get on with running the country. Mm. And we've no assembly to run. Well, well I mean nationally, yes, that, that's mm. the next problem and the best of luck to Julian Smith. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure he'd appreciate that comment. Uh, John, how would you sum up where we are? Uh, I think the parliamentary arithmetic is very tight. If I had to have a bet on it, I'd say Boris Johnson will get this through on, on Saturday and I think that probably will be at the end of it. I don't see you know, the, the forces of Remain then carrying on a, a, a battle uh, unless the economic consequences of this deal were, were somehow disastrous, which I, I rather doubt. I, I think that probably would, we probably will move into the risk of tempting fate here, slightly more tranquil politics than we've experienced John, over can the you, last three years. How can you possibly say that? It would only be the start of row after row at Stormont, would it not, if these institutions are ever restored? Well, I don't, I don't see Stormont coming back anytime soon. I mean, w- what are the incentives to go back into Stormont? We've got an RHI inquiry report to come. Uh, a lot of, Some of the issues are still unresolved. 
I mean, where are the incentives to, to get back into Stormont? Um, I, I don't, I don't see them. And so, if there isn't to be the restoration of Stormont, what is there to be? How's this place going to be run? Well, the, the, this is a f- the fantasy element of this sixty-four page document. These, <laughs> I mean, you know, this, these eight-year plans, these four-year plans for, for Stormont. I mean, Stormont has only ha- ever had one eight-year term, um, and that was oft- often chronically unstable. So, you know, there's, there's huge questions over the actual consent mechanisms that are built into this document. More broadly, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. W- what? What does the Secretary of State do, Julian Smith, in terms of this now? If Stormont is not going to be revived, uh, even after some sort of breakthrough this week, does he go for direct rule? No, because, you know, that's the end of the Good Friday Agreement. If you get rid of Strand 1 and take away the institutions and formally abandon them, that's the death of the Good Friday Agreement, just at a time when, you know, this deal struck today is, is lauded as, as having, you know, respected the Good Friday Agreement. So, so who does enact the deal here on our behalf if there's no storm on. Well, it's the default mechanism kicks in, which is simply that, that um, the default mechanism kicks in, which is basically that uh, Northern Ireland remains heavily aligned to the, the European Union Single Market and Customs Union. Well, uh, as I said, it could be the start of continuing rows, if that's possible, to start, talk about a start of continuing rows, the continuation of rows that there have been over Brexit, and goodness, there have been many here in Northern Ireland. My uh, thanks to you, Professor John Tong, and to Felicity Houston for staying the course and guiding us through this. Uh, that is it uh, from this special edition, especially extended edition of Talkback. Um, I'm back for more. Uh, at five o'clock. Please join me on Evening Extra. And don't forget The View tonight. Yeah, there'll be more. Mark Carruthers uh, on Television Mark and the politics team recording a special edition of Red Lines this afternoon. Look out for that on BBC Sounds and other podcast providers. And of course, The View later on. Hugo is up after the news. I presume a Brexit-free zone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you for listening. On 92 to 95 FM and 1341 medium wave, this is BBC Radio Ulster. It's two o'clock at the BBC News Desk. I'm Siobhan McGarry. Boris Johnson has agreed a new Brexit deal with the European Union, which ditches the Northern Ireland backstop. He says the UK will leave the EU's customs union as one United Kingdom. 